In this video, I'm going to do a brief review of strength of materials or the theory of elasticity as it relates to the finite element analysis. Now, when we talk about strength of materials or the theory of elasticity, we're really talking about what's going on inside of a solid material, specifically the stress, strain, and the displacement. So what is this stress analysis boundary value problem? You might not have heard stress analysis described in terms of a boundary value problem previously, and that is because it really happens at a higher level than most undergraduate programs go. So strength of materials is what most undergraduate engineers are familiar with. And strength of materials develops equations that are derived to describe specific observed deformation. For example, you can use strength of materials to describe the uh, bending of a beam or the axial tension of a rod or something like that. Uh, these are developed for specific geometries and specific loading conditions and they are very powerful within that realm. But if you want something a little bit more generalized like would be needed to formulate FEA then you need to go to the theory of elasticity typically taught as a graduate course in engineering. The theory of elasticity gives a theoretical description of deformation based on first principles. It is generic, it applies to any geometry and any loading condition, which is pretty awesome. However, it is only solvable in closed form for very simple cases. So you could derive some of strength of materials results from the theory of elasticity, and you can derive some additional things that we can't easily get to from strength of materials. For instance, plates and shells are better derived using theory of elasticity than strength of materials. But they are roughly equivalent, just the, the focus is a bit different. The theory of elasticity is what describes the boundary value problem that we're going to use FEA to solve. If you're not familiar with the theory of elasticity, I'm going to give a very brief overview here. Bear in mind, this is a course that's typically taught for a semester in a graduate program, sometimes expanded beyond that. So this, this is a very high level, quick overview of what's going on in that theory. The idea is that there are four types of equations that govern a real displacement field, a field that's possible in the physical world. And those four types can be summarized as the equilibrium equations, or the differential balance of forces, the compatibility equations that relate to the constancy of material, that is material doesn't get created, destroyed, overlap, um, separate, things like that. Uh, third are the stress-strain relations. Most people are familiar, most engineers are familiar with the generalized Hooke's law. And then the boundary conditions, the things that nail down that displacement field to the surrounding reality. Go through each of those in a little bit more detail. The equilibrium equations are typically written as three differential equations and they involve six stress variables. Note that you could also write a total of six differential equations and nine stress variables, but typically we use three equations to eliminate three of the stress variables. I'll explain more in um, a couple of slides on that. Compatibility consists of six differential equations and it includes six strain variables and three displacement variables in its typical form used at least in FEA. It can be expressed in two different ways. Strain displacement relationships are the ones that we'll use for FEA, but alternately it could be written as six strain compatibility equations. But either way we're looking at six differential equations here. Stress strain relations, these are typically, if we're using generalized Hooke's law, linear equations for linear elasticity. And there are no new variables introduced here. So basically this is establishing the relationship between the stress and the strain variables. So in total we now have 15 variables and 15 equations. In order to, to find a final solution though, because of the differential equations, we also need some boundary conditions. Typically specified displacements or slopes at specific locations. So let's take a look at the equilibrium equations for the theory of elasticity in a 2D case. We'll start with a simple differential piece of material, dx by dy, and then let's look at the stresses that could be applied onto the surface of this given a varying stress field. That's important. The stress field is allowed to vary across the surface of this element. So if we look at stress in the x direction acting on the x face, that would be sigma x, we can say on the left side that's just sigma x, but on the right side, because stress can vary, we have sigma x plus d sigma x dx times dx, the distance that we've moved. Similarly in the y direction, sigma y and sigma y plus d sigma y dy times dy, 
And then we have the shear stress, tau xy, so the shear stress acting on the x face in the y direction, and tau yx, the shear stress acting on the y face in the x direction. So this would be the state of stress acting on the different sides of this differential piece of material. In addition, let's imagine that we can have some general body force acting. So this would be force per unit area, I'm sorry, per unit volume. Okay, so this would be the possible stresses acting. When we talk about equilibrium, we want to talk about forces. So the equation that we're going to use is the sum of the forces in the x direction. But note here, I'm doing the force per unit thickness of this material because I'm looking in 2D. So we, take, uh, we say that that has to be zero because we're in equilibrium. So then we can sum the forces in the x direction, Fbx, and then the sigma axis, and then the tau yx terms. And that gives us this full expression that we see down here where I've taken the stress terms and I've multiplied them by the length that they're acting on. And then remember there's also a thickness that I'm neglecting here because it's constant for everything. So I can simplify this expression. In fact, it simplifies pretty nicely once I divide through by dx dy and I cancel the terms. So sigma x minus sigma x tau yx minus tau yx. Um, and then similarly, I could do exactly the same thing in the y direction and it would give me the equation shown here. Equilibrium in 3D is a little bit harder to visualize, so I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to say you can see by expansion of the equations that we just had, I get three force equations. Some of the forces in the x direction, some of the forces in the y direction, and some of the forces in the z direction. So what changed is I add the uh, z terms. So the tau zx, tau zy, and then the third equation comes from the sum of the forces in the z direction. So these are my three force equations for equilibrium for a generic system of um, changing stresses on a differential element. In addition, if I were to look at the sum of the moments on that element, that would just tell me the interrelationship between the tau xy, tau yx, and so on. So what we typically do is we use these last three equations, the one that come from the moment, to eliminate three stress variables. So we simply don't track tau zy because we assume it's exactly the same thing as tau yz based on the moment equilibrium equations. So that leaves us with six variables and three differential equations summarized by the, the, this set right here start out looking at the relationship between strain and displacement and we're going to initially look at a um, uh, the the normal strains and then we will do shear strains now it's important to note here i'm assuming you know what strains are and in a moment i'll assume you know what stresses are so you have to have a good basis in solid mechanics before you come into um, fea all right so suppose i have a small block of material of length delta x and it experiences a displacement, delta u. Then I can define the strain in that block of material as epsilon x is approximately equal to the change in length divided by the original length. Now if I make that go very small, so my block of material becomes an infinitesimal piece of material, then epsilon x is equal to the limit as delta x goes to zero of delta u over delta x, or in other words, epsilon x is just equal to the derivative of the displacement with respect to the position, so du dx. So that's it for um, normal stresses. Same thing for epsilon y or epsilon z. Obviously, we have to switch over from um, a total derivative to a partial derivative if we're dealing with um, multiple directions here because displacement in the x direction could depend on position in the y, for example. Okay, now let's talk about shear strains. Imagine I have a block of material that has a, a length delta x and a height delta y, and I'm going to deform it so that it experiences some shear strains, as shown here. When I shear a block of material, I'm going to have an angle change at the corner. So I'll have a total angle change. I'll talk about that in a moment. But I'm going to look at the angle change of the horizontal leg. That's an alpha. And the angle change of the vertical leg. And that's beta. 
turns out that the total change in angle then, of course, is just alpha plus beta, and that's actually our definition of shear strain. So gamma xy in this case is equal to alpha plus beta. So let's add some uh, displacements there. So if we look at the uh, right-hand side of this block of material, so where the alpha angle is, we have a displacement of that corner of delta V. V is a displacement in the y direction. So we have a small displacement delta V. The angle in the uh, small angle approximation, alpha can be defined to be delta V divided by delta X, as we can see over here. If we do the same thing over on the vertical side, we can see that that formerly vertical edge now has experienced, the top part of it has experienced a uh, displacement delta U, and the angle beta can be defined to be delta U divided by delta Y in the small angle approximation. So we add those together and we introduce the limit as delta X and delta Y go to zero then I'm going to get that the shear strain, gamma xy, is equal to dv dx plus du dy. So we just developed the strain displacement relationships in 2D. I've got epsilon x equals du dx, epsilon y equals dv dy, and gamma xy is equal to du dy plus dv dx. What I'd like to do is put these into matrix form. And it's not just because it's FEA and I like to do everything in matrix form, it's because it's actually useful that way, as we'll see in a few lessons. So in matrix form, I can say that the vector epsilon x, epsilon y, gamma xy is equal to the partial derivative matrix operator. Not a true matrix, because it's an operator. Um, it's d by dx 0, 0 d by dy, d by dy, d by dx, and that is acting on the displacement vector uv. If I multiply the um, matrix operator onto the um, displacement vector, I will get the expressions that are shown at the left here. I can also simplify no my notation when I use this. So now I can write the strain vector as simply epsilon, the partial derivative matrix operator as the partial derivative operator, and then the displacement vector as simply u. Okay, now let's talk about the relationship between stress and strain. And I'm going to use as an example the isotropic plane stress case. So isotropic, meaning same in all directions, plane stress, meaning there is no component of stress in the z direction. So I'll start out with the 2D Hooke's Law. So I've got epsilon x is equal to 1 over e times sigma x minus nu times sigma y. Epsilon y is equal to 1 over e times the quantity sigma y minus nu sigma x. And finally, gamma xy is equal to tau xy divided by g. That's my 2D Hooke's Law. What I basically want to do is show you that you can write this in matrix form. First of all, I'm going to rearrange terms, so I define in terms of stress, or have stress defined in terms of strain. So I can look at it either way. It turns out that this right-hand description is the uh, more useful for us in FEA. So then I'm going to capture those terms in a matrix. So here I have on the left-hand side my stress vector, on the right hand side is my strain vector and between them is the compliance matrix. E over 1 minus nu squared times the matrix 1 nu 0, nu 1 0, 0 0, 1 minus nu over 2. The nice thing again, I can use this to get a shorthand form. That's not the reason I'm doing it, but it's a nice benefit. Um, I can just write sigma is equal to D the D matrix is my material properties, times the strain matrix. So now we've got some tools. We know how to manipulate matrices. We know uh, how to look at stress and strain, how they're related in matrix form, and we know how to look at strain and displacement, their relationship in matrix form. So this is the background information. In the next lesson, we will jump into our first finite element analysis.
Let me make a few quick comments on the last type of equation that governs the boundary value problem for theory of elasticity. Boundary conditions are known values of displacements or derivatives of displacements. So for, in other words, we know the displacement u at some location, xi, yi, and we know that to be ui. And you can do this as vectors. It's easier probably to think about it as scalars initially, but I wanna make a few comments about this. First off, this is a necessary part of solving the boundary value problem. If we don't have boundary values, then the solution of the differential equations are gonna have constants. In addition, specifying the boundary conditions enables the equations to be solved for specific, for specific displacements rather than displacements that can vary by the constant. Physically, these boundary conditions mean something because we have a solid object that is not um, that is fixed in a particular location in space. So it ties things down, prevents them from drifting in space. If you try to run a finite element analysis without proper boundary conditions, sometimes it will run if the software written for it is, um, has tools to overcome under constrained problems, but sometimes it won't run. And even if it does run, those results might not be correct. So looking at the boundary conditions in FEA is a critical part of setting up your finite element analysis model. So in summary, the boundary value problem that we use for finite element analysis comes from the theory of elasticity, and it gives us four types of equations. We get the differential equations of equilibrium, the one in the x direction is shown here. We get the differential strain displacement equations that provide compatibility of the material, meaning the material can't overlap itself and it can't gap. Um, that comes from the symbolic form of the equation here, strains related to displacements. We get the stress-strains re relationships, also called the constitutive law, and we get some boundary conditions.